those who are here and those who are joining us online, uh, really from all over the world, I want to welcome you. My name is Rick Thompson. Um, if by chance you've been watching and tuning in regularly, you know that we are in a series that we've entitled Games People Play. Games People Play. And in this series, we've been kind of looking at the fact that oftentimes those childhood games that we played had more to do with real life than we ever thought. I mean, we, we've discovered that so far, right? Amen? Now, we saw that with Trivial Pursuit. We saw that um, with the game called Trouble. We saw that with, the, with Sorry. And, and, and in each one of these games, there was a message for each and every one of us. There was something for us to avoid, and there was something for us to embrace, a, a, a right place, if you will, to pitch your tent, and, and, a, and a wrong place, a, a right way to deal with the troubles when they come into your life, and there's a wrong way to deal with those troubles. There's a godly sorrow that the Bible talks about. We talked about that during that, during that, uh, that, that uh, message that displays true repentance and leads to a changed life and, and salvation that, that results with no regrets. And there's a worldly sorrow. And the Bible says there's a, that worldly sorrow is, a, is when we offer faux apologies or fake apologies. And, and we might be able to, to, to fool ourselves. We might be able to fool people. But how many know you can't fool God? Amen? You can't ever fool God. And so that worldly sorrow, the Bible says, at the end of the day, will lead somewhere. It will lead to death. It will lead to death. Uh, with, so there will be regrets. So indeed, the games that people play often parody life itself, and, and so it is with today's game. If you haven't guessed what it is, it is Monopoly, Monopoly. Again, we've all played it before. This, this in fact, I, I said at the beginning of the series, there was one game that we've all played in my family, but there was one game that was banned. <laughs> banned after several unsuccessful games where things you know, deteriorated quickly <laughs> into chaos and, and intense and emotional feelings. And, and, for, and for some reason, this was one of them because whenever we play this game, I have four kids and, and, and my wife, it all turned, it, it, it seemed to deteriorate into everybody against dad. And where are my dads out there? You know what I'm talking about? Everybody against dad. And, and, and so the, the goal was <laughs> to beat dad. That, that was the goal. And, and, and if by chance I did win, I, I couldn't make it through the game without hearing someone say, you cheated, you know? And, 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 and yes, there'd be folks cheating in the game, but it wasn't me, okay? And so, in fact, my daughter, speaking of cheating, my daughter, I told her I was going to be doing this, this game for, this, for today, and she said, you know, Dad, apparently, they, they, because cheating is so prevalent in the game of Monopoly, they come up with a, a new edition to encourage it. They, they, it's called a cheater's edition. Did you know that? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty. It says, it says on there, what can you get away with? And they encourage you to steal money and to make moves and to do all sorts of stuff. The only thing that, the only rule basically is that you saw it on the board. It says the only rule is that you don't get caught. And if you get caught, you get handcuffed. Now, I'm not quite sure how that works in the game, but to me, it looks like a fight starter. Come on, somebody. <laughs> if we were having problems with the regular rules, can you imagine if I brought this game into my house uh, where, the, where cheating is encouraged? Well, all of that sounds about right with what we're seeing in the world today. Let me go ahead and just define the terms. Uh, monopoly defined has two definitions that I saw in the dictionary. It says, it's a company or group having the exclusive possession or control of the supply of or trade in a commodity or service. In other words, you've cornered the market, you are a monopoly, everything, you are controlling that. But the other one was a trademark, and it says it's a board game in which players engage in simulated property and financial dealings using imitation money. It was invented in the U.S., and the name was coined by Charles Darrow in 1935. Do you know this game is that old? 1930. Who's played Monopoly? Just show your hand. Throw your hand. I better say who has not played Monopoly. No, everybody, everybody has played Monopoly at some point in their life. And so, and so, so if you've ever played, you know that, that that is indeed the goal of the game, the first definition, that the person who owns it all or the most 
at the end of the game wins the game. And so, so you kind of roll the dice, you wheel and deal, you, you finagle to position yourself to be that last man standing, the person who's in that position of ultimate power and control. Uh, and in the cheater's edition, well, apparently anything goes. You just don't get caught. Again, how, how does this imitate life? Well, it's the very message that we're told, uh, minus the cheating, but in some cases not minus the cheating, should be our goal in life. It's what, it's what the world tells us that we should be striving for in, in life, to pursue with all our heart, riches, or power, or control, all based on the world's version of the golden rule. What's the church's version of the golden rule? Do unto others as, they would, as, as you would have them do unto you. For the world's version of the golden rule is he who owns the gold rules. He who owns the gold rules. Now contrast that directly with what Jesus taught. And we've seen this, this line go throughout the whole series. It says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, this is what Jesus said. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? He who owns the gold rules, what good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? So just like in Trivial Pursuit, God is saying that there's more important things in life than the pursuit of worldly gains and the pursuit of riches. Now, you might ask, such as what, Pastor Rick? I'm so glad you asked. Top of that list, I would think, is possibly Jesus said what's more important than gaining the whole world is the condition of your soul. I'm talking to somebody in this place. It's the condition of your soul. It's to your position in Christ. It's your relationship with the Lord. Where you're going to spend eternity, every single one of us, the Bible says, has an eternal soul that's going to live forever somewhere. Where's that going to be? Is it going to be with God? Or is it going to be eternally separated from the Father in a place that he created, not from men, but men will end up there, but it says he created it for the devil and his angels. Well, how about hearing him say, so, so many of us who've heard the call in our lives where you responded to Jesus in your life, at the end of the day, who wants to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? I mean, that's me, right? I, I, I want to hear, well done. Uh, when I stand before the Father, <laughs> I don't want to hear, what have you done? I want to hear well done, okay? So these to me are all more important than running after riches and all these other things. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, he says, but people who long to be rich, watch this, fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and they've pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, notice what it says here. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That means it's, it's at the base of so many different types of evil. At, at its core, at its root, is the love of money. Not Money itself. People often misquote the scripture and they say, you know, money is the root of all evil. You know what this Bible says? Money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Truth be told, we all need money. We all need money, and I'd rather have money than not have money. When I have money, it's easier to pay my bills than when I don't have money. So, so, so what's it talking about? It's not about you having or needing money. You've heard me say this before. It's, it's when money has you. It's when that becomes your all-encompassing focus in life. When, when, when the pursuit of it comes before everything else, especially your relationship with God, your relationship with your Father, your relationship with, with, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. When you love money and things more than God, the Bible has a word for that. He calls it idolatry. And you're heading for problems. Jesus said as much. What does he say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24? Read it out loud with me. One, two, three, go. No one can serve two masters, 
Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the actual translation for money in, in the Hebrew is mammon. Mammon. Now, why did mammon translate to money? Well, because mammon was a god, liturgy of wealth, regarded as evil or immoral. And those who worship mammon are equivalent to greedy people who value money too highly. In other words, mammon was a demon spirit that people worship, knowingly or unknowingly. It's a spirit. So to succumb to this spirit is not just about status or income. People will say, oh, rich people, they, they have that problem. No, it's not just about being rich because this spirit will affect and infect all types of people. It will, it, it will affect the rich or infect the rich. It will infect the poor. It will infect the middle class. It affects all races and ethnicities and all political persuasions. People ser uh, searching for what I call heaven on earth or, or, or gl a globalist utopia or, or, or they just want to set up their own kingdom where, where they're in charge and in control and they, they got to get as much money as possible. And, and, and they fight to take over grounds. And, and in this world, they, they take over governments and they take over systems and they do whatever it takes so that they can remain in control. And when that happens, they, they, they turn back and say, well, capitalism is evil. And in some people's mind, it is. And so, and so what they say is, well, well, to replace capitalism, we have to replace it with more progressivism or, or, or socialism. And socialism at its root calls for more government control, more government influence. In other words, the government is going to take care of your problems. And the end result of that system is a system called communism. And unfortunately, because of the evil inclinations of the hearts of men, no matter what system you put out there, whatever ism takes over, whoever is at the top of that little pyramid, because of greed, that spirit of mammon does whatever it takes to get and keep power and control. That's also Islamism under Sharia law. This system will, will, will try to take control, and then that, the golden rule goes into effect. He who owns the gold, whoever is in control, whoever, the, who, uh, whoever owns the gold rules. Followed quickly by the second implemented rule for people in that system, he who owns the guns rules, which is why our forefathers, and we're celebrating um, Independence Day this weekend, but they had the foreknowledge once they gained the independence to, 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 to set up a democratic republic, and the first two amendments of the Bill of Rights initially is what they put in there. It says Article 1, and I, I found a thing where it says that people are trying to cross out our Bill of Rights from the from the top to the bottom, but that first one, if you can read it, it says, Congress shall make no laws, no laws um, restricting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You know, there are people apparently protesting doesn't spread the virus, but going to church does. Anybody see that on the news? In California, they, they're passing laws where you can't sing in church because it's now dangerous. Congress shall uh, uh, impose no laws affecting the establishment of religion or the prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition their government for redress or grievance. And the second, Article 2 of the Bill of Rights, says this, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and do what? To keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Article 2 of the Bill of Rights. Now, why was that put in place by our forefathers? Was it just for personal protection from thieves and robbers? I, I would suggest that it may have been for personal protection, but that wasn't the initial reason why they put that in place. They put that in place to protect the people 
from the isms, from the takeover government who that once the people got in control, they now own the gold and, and they think now they rule and now in order to rule, now we're gonna take your guns. You now work for them. And you either do what they say at the threat of your life or you're gonna have a problem. See communist Cuba, if you're looking for a reference. See socialist Venezuela, look at North Korea. That's a police state. The people in North Korea are slaves to that system. You cannot say boo without permission. If you do, you just disappear. Look at communist China, the same thing. Hitler's Nazi, Sharia law, and the radical Islamists. You see, for us in this country at the time, it was the tyrannical rule of the English monarchy and the dynasty, so that that's what sparked us toward pushing toward our independence, our, our freedom day, uh, freedom of religion, the taxation without representation. That's what caused everything to say, you know what, we're not going to do this. I, I don't want the government, I don't want England over there telling me how I have to live over here. And a war was fought, a bloody war called the Independence, War of Independence, which, which brought about the birth of this great nation, which we celebrate celebrated yesterday, and we are over 200, what is it, 40 years old, old as a country, young compared to other countries. So, so it's one thing, listen to me, to birth a, a democracy or a democratic republic, it's another thing entirely to keep it. Are you listening to me? And once the First Amendment, and, and especially the Second Amendment goes, and they start confiscating and restricting all your rights, your freedoms, and, and the, uh, 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 quickly to follow. Then goes your guns, and then goes your country. But at the root of all these isms, at the root of all these isms, whatever ism it is, the Bible says the love of money is the root of that. A, a lot of the evils that are going on, the power and control when these isms and these systems take control, how many of you know Christianity has a problem? They start to persecute it. You know why? Because we're called not to bow to systems. We're called to bow to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So you read your history, all these systems that take control eventually start to have a problem <laughs> with, the, with the Christianity because we follow we, we follow under Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Now, that's how it looks on a macro level. On, on a micro level, listen to me, people do all sorts of stupid and base things in pursuit of money, things that end up hurting them and, and, and or their loved ones in the long run, the chasing, a, the, the, um, chasing after stuff that, that it's only going to hurt you. That's the problem with those who are addicted to gambling, the, the people chasing after get-rich-quick schemes, the, the husband who's always working and never takes time for their family, even on Sundays, no time for God. Too busy for God. Now listen to me. If you're too busy for God, you are just too busy. If you can't carve out some time, you are just too busy. And so, it's the, it's a, and so it's, it's, we, we always think, of, oh, it's the drug pusher and the stripper and the con man. But let me tell you, it's not just them. It's the, it's the banker and the businessman. It's the Hollywood elites. It's the politicians. Anybody and everyone can be infected and affected by this spirit, the spirit of mammon that's driving all these people, the love of money, the need to have control and, 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 and to, to be able to do whatever you want apart from God. And in the end, it leads to one place. The scripture is very clear. It leads to ruin and destruction and empty chasing after the wind. For, the Bible says for some people, they even wander from the faith. God is not moving quick enough for them. And so they start to take a different path in life in order to try to get a hold of this money. An empty chasing after the wind. Again, don't just take my word for it. Hear it from, hear it from King Solomon himself, who played his own version of the Monopoly game during his time. 
And then we're going to see what he concluded after he played the game. Now listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched that foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my my many flourishing groves. I brought slaves. I brought slaves, both men and women, And others were born into the household, just a side note, every nation on this planet has owned slaves at some point. Just saying, read your history books. More than of of the kings owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in in, in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, and treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women. I had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom, and my wisdom, and my wisdom never failed me. Take note of that. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. And so we have King Solomon, Mr. Monopoly, if you will, after amassing great wealth, denying himself nothing his eyes desired. He he had houses and he had slaves and he had servants, men and women. He had wives and he had concubines. He had fields and he had gardens. And after he, he, he amassed all these things, he called it all meaningless, a chasing After the wind, what was gained under the sun? And now for Mr. Monopoly, King Solomon, he was fortunate because while he was trying this grand experiment and he had the resources to to follow through, he said that during this time, he, that his wisdom stayed with him. His wisdom stayed with him. Now, there are people who go after these things with all their hearts and their wisdom leaves them. They die without ever figuring out what he figured out, that that he who dies with the most toys is still dead. It's getting quiet in here. And so the question is then, Pastor Rick, what's the solution? I mean, this is what we were sold, to gather as much things as possible. And you're saying that that that's not what the Bible tells us to do. What's the solution? I'm going to tell you what the solution is. I want you to write this down. The solution is contentment. Contentment. In fact, Timothy expounded on it. He says, yet true godliness, that means being like God, with contentment is itself, what is it? Help me. What's great wealth? True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. I always like how the Bible kind of flip th- flips things <laughs> on its head. Jesus says the greatest of you will be a servant. On what planet anywhere in the world is the servant considered the greatest? Only in Jesus' kingdom. Amen? Was Jesus lying? The greatest of you are servants. The world system has it flipped on its head. And so he's saying that true godliness with contentment 
if you want to be rich, that's great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. You're rich. <laughs> now, let me tell you what contentment isn't before I go any further. It's not settling or giving up on your future plans. It's going to sit around and do nothing. That's not what it says. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, doing good, doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we, help me someone, if we do not give up. Tell me someone, say, don't give up. Look at me in the eyes, say, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Too many people are like, well, Pastor Rick said God wants me to just be content, so. I'll just sit, sit here playing my video games and don't have a job. I'm just waiting around, waiting on God to work things out. I heard people say that. I heard people <laughs> say stuff like that. Pastor Rick, I'm, I'm just waiting on God. And God is like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on you. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to take some steps, to, to, to move out, make some plans, to trust me for the results. I like to say it this way, back in the day when we, remember when we first started learning how to, to drive a car and before your parents would give you the keys, the actual keys to the car, what you do? You sit in the car and you, you sit there, I remember, you, we play with the, with the wheel and we, we turn it back in the day, it was a hard turn, you know, it was a turn it and then we turn it back. But how many know it, it ain't going nowhere, right? It, it's just sitting there. In fact, it's actually easier to, to steer a car if it starts to move. Oh, wow, that, that, that's worth the price of admission by itself. It's easier to steer a moving vehicle than one that's just sitting in place. Listen to me. So much of God's economy is seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. In other words, you will reap what you sow. But if you don't sow, you won't reap. Does that make sense? If you don't plant, don't expect a few weeks from now, a few months from now, to, to, to get anything from that. My daughter, Amanda, you know, you know with the apocalypse and everything, she, she's planting. So, 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 so she made herself a little plant in case there's a <laughs> in case the stores are overrun with food, she wants to be able to give her family greens. And so she, made, she built a little thing. And, and, and this, is, this is cool for our house because every, everyone in my house feels like they don't, they don't have a green thumb. And so, but so this is a grand experiment. She, she built things, and then she made lines and lines, and then she planted. She planted tomatoes. She planted lettuce. She planted string beans. She planted strawberries. I think, I think it's strawberries. She planted a whole bunch of stuff. And she watered it, took care of it. And then after a few weeks, what sprouted? The harvest. Uh, the harvest. Now, how silly would it have been for her to say, I want to see if I can do this, I'll build a box, I'll put out dirt, uh, I won't put seed in there. And I'll just keep watering it because I'm going to believe God's going to put something in there. A few weeks from then, can you expect to see anything? Nothing. Why? Because you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And so... If you don't sow, you won't reap. If you sow, if you sow into your future by, I, I don't know, taking courses or learning a skill, you will eventually reap the benefit of that sowing, the knowledge that you gain. Pastor, Pastor Rick, I'm, I'm waiting on God for my finances. Why? Sow. Sow expectantly. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, remember this, whatever so whoever sows sparingly will also, help me somebody, reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly 
or under compulsion, for God loves a, a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. I, I, I love that little scenario. All things, at all times, having all I need, I will abound in every good work. If you need funds, you need to sow funds. Amen? If you need grace, you need to sow grace. You don't want people being hard for every stupid thing we say and do? Then don't be hard on people for every stupid thing they, they say and do to you. If you need kindness, be kind. Sow it. If you want forgiveness, become a forgiving person. If you need friends in your life, be friendly. Ta-da. If you want a good husband, ooh, people tuning in now, <laughs> become a good wife. Not the way the world defines it. Open up your Bible and see how God defines a good woman. <laughs> If you, want, if you want a good wife, invest in becoming a good man, a good husband. You don't have to wait till you get a wife. Get in God's word. Get in God's prayer. Read some books, Christian books. Let God and his word and the Holy Spirit start to inform you. Start sowing in that area. Start making changes in your behavior. You're probably not going to find them, notwithstanding that some of you probably did because of the grace of God. But you're probably not going to find them at the bar or in the club. I'm just saying. Make some changes. Take on some standards that you would like to see in the, in the person that you expect to come into your life. If you want to be a part of a team, be a team player. You will reap what you sow. God's economy is based on seed time. Seed, plant the seed, time, and then eventually a harvest. But if you don't put the seed in, I don't care how much time you have to wait. Nothing is coming up. But when you put the seed in, Pastor Rick, I put the seed in yesterday and I'm still having financial problems today. <laughs> seed, time, and then harvest. How long of a time? I don't know. It depends. There's one time I, I early on when my wife and I were struggling, I was in, in between jobs. I got invited to, a, uh, it wasn't Abundant Life, but it was his, his brother's church back in the day. And I was pretty much broke at the time. And then the preacher came on there, and I'm like one of those guys. I don't want to hear about finances all the time. I don't, I don't think every message turns into that, should even turn into that. But sure enough, he opened up the book of Genesis, and I said, oh, great, great. It's going to be something out of Genesis, which is awesome. And he talks about where it says where, where the earth was formless and void in the, in, the, in the land. And then God spoke, and then there was. So that's great. That's awesome. And so then he said, and the Lord, I believe the Lord told me to tell you guys that if you would create a void in your pocket, <laughs> that God is going to fill those pockets. So right away, my eyes are rolling up in my head. They're almost getting stuck. I'm like disgusted. I'm like disgusted that you took the scripture and you just totally took it out of context just so you can get a big offering. But I said, you know what? I didn't have a lot of money anyway. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take out what I, I'm going to create a void just to prove that this is complete nonsense. I think I had like a dollar and 22 cents. Pull it out, offering plate drop. I, emptied out my pockets. 
because I actually had a need because we were financially having trouble. I just sold that thing. As he continued on, I mean, my disgust, just thinking about, you know, I can't stand these preachers that do stuff like this. Maybe 20 minutes into it, someone taps me on the shoulder. I turn around, it's a woman. I don't know. She said, the Lord just told me to give you this. She handed me something. I didn't look at it. I thank you, I put it in my pocket. After we walked out, I walked out. It was a check for like 150 bucks. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. What just happened? What just happened? And so sometimes God will use the foolish things in this world to confound the wise. But I did learn a lesson there. I know you won't hear me talking about, you know, create voids in your pockets and all this other stuff. But I did learn the principle of seed time and harvest. Sometimes the harvest comes like that. So I think God was just messing with me that day. But sometimes it takes a while. You understand what I'm saying? So be patient with the seed time, seed time, and the harvest. Because you will reap if you do not quit. Isn't that what it says? You reap a harvest if you do not quit. And so, Philippians 4.8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything, keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Now listen, that doesn't sound like you're passively sitting around to me. That sounds like you're actively pursuing something, something that gets the God of peace's attention so much so that he's going to reside with you. Anybody want the God of peace to reside with him? Amen. Amen? Well, Paul is laying out on an outline as to how that happens. God doesn't want us settling for garbage publicly or in our private thoughts either or our private lives. So Philippians 3.12 says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, Paul speaking, but I press on to take hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, press on. Press on. Press on. Are you having a hard time? Press on. Is school difficult? Being home and doing it this way, press on. Someone unfriended you on Facebook? Oh. Uh, press on. If you're dealing with sickness or, or, in your family or struggles or, or personal failures, press on. Press on. Press on. The prize doesn't, doesn't go to the citizen quitters. It goes to the ones who understand that their future is not in their rearview mirror. Come on, somebody. You are never going to get to where you need to be by looking through the rearview mirror. God has called us to press on, to keep pressing forward. Paul says, I forget that which is behind me, and I press on. God has a plan for each and every one of us, not to be caught up in the monopoly game, but to be content. And content is not sitting and quitting. It's accepting and resting you can put this in the promises of God. It's accepting and resting in the promises of God. Philippians 4.11. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Listen, listen. I, I, know, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned 
the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Isn't that a powerful statement? Listen, contentment must be learned. How did, how did Paul learn contentment? God allowed him to go through some things. Things that he had to go through in order for him to trust that God was going to take him through some things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, situations and circumstances. The Bible talks about he was hungry. There were times in Paul's ministry, if you read his ministry in the book of Acts, he was shipwrecked. There were times when he was rejected. People picked up stones to stone him. He was abused. He was in prison. What did he learn through all of this? Well, he gave us what the secret is. He gave us what the secret of contentment is. He said he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. Good things, bad things, sunshine or rain, he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. As a matter of fact, that's a great one to memorize. I'm going to give you an assignment. You're listening online. That is your assignment. Philippians 4, 13. Memorize that one. At the end of the day, Mr. Monopoly figured this out. That Solomon, he figured this out as well. Listen to what he said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He said, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands. For this is, what does it say? Whose duty? Whose duty? Everyone. This is everyone's duty. Fear God and obey his commands. And God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Someone just said, oh, snap. Fear God and obey his commands. Or fear God and obey his word. Or stand on his promises. That's a good place to be if you're going to avoid the monopoly game and you're going you're gonna to end up in a place of contentment. The monopoly game in life is a fool's game. It's a fool's game. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. In that story in Luke chapter 12 where it talks about the man who had a lot of things and he thought to himself, you know what? I've got enough to live for the rest of my life. I will take what I have. I fill up my barns. And I will, I will eat, drink, and be merry. He had just enough. My pastor used to say, Brother Don, he get all you can, can all you get, and sit on your can. That's basically what the American dream is. But this is what Jesus said to that man in Luke chapter 12, verse 20. And you can read the previous uh, story when you get a chance. He said, but, but God, someone say, but God. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. Listen, God is not against us having riches. He's against those riches having us. The Bible says we cannot serve God and money or mammon. And so we need to learn the secret of contentment, which is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Jesus said the person is a fool who stirs up earthly wealth, but is not rich toward God. He's not against us stirring up earthly wealth. If he did, he'd have to apologize to people he made very wealthy. He says, but you're not rich toward the things of God. If you store up earthly wealth to the exclusion of your relationship to the Father, and again, this is not just a, a, a someone with means problem. There are people who are, their heart is about the hustle every single day, of, of every single week, of every single month, of every single year. It's all about the hustle. And the Bible says you cannot serve God and money. You will either love one, hate the other, despise one, cling to the other, but you cannot serve God and, and, and things. And so you have to make a decision. And my decision is simply this. This is the promise that Jesus made. He said, if I get to the place where I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
He says, all these things will be added unto you. All these things will be added unto you. And the, and the person the Bible says is rich is the person who's, uh, who is, is lives godly and lives uh, with contentment. He says, that person is the wealthy person. And, and they put their trust in the, in the Heavenly Father for their everyday uh, needs and means. Now, if I seek the kingdom of God at first in my life, guess what he's going to do? He's going to give me the desires of my heart. doesn't mean he's going to give me a Lamborghini or whatever. He's going to write his desires on your heart. And what are the desires that God's going to write on your heart? Because he says in, in the last days under the new covenant, God's not going to, to write uh, his commandments on tablets of stone. He's going to write them on the, 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 the soft flesh of your, of your heart. And what is he going to say? He's going to say, listen, you have an eternal soul that will live forever somewhere. And I have made provision for each and every one of you so that you can live with me. Seek me first. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness or my right standing. Which means that it's not about you being good. It's about you trusting not in your own righteousness, but, but, push, but putting your trust in the righteousness that God provided through his son, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And in that moment that I come in the relationship, I humble myself and say, Lord, I, I, I am a sinner. I need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. The Bible says the moment I come into relationship with Jesus along those lines, my sins are washed away. And in, in, in place of my sins, he gives me robes of righteousness. And now his Holy Spirit takes up residence in me, and he writes his will on my heart and he's got a plan and a specific purpose for every single one of us yes and the call on my life may not be the exact call on your life we all have a call to follow Jesus amen but the call might be specific to you it might be to whom he's called you to reach certainly your family your neighbors your co-workers your friends but he wants you to be his representative for such a time as now. Um, I don't know that, that you can't sense what I'm sensing. It just feels like things are either winding up or winding down in this world. And God's called us to live sober. When Jesus was asked, you know, when's the end going to come? He said, listen, only the Father knows that. But what I'm called you to do is to be ready, to not be spiritually lazy, not just to be... You know, I'm just waiting on God. No, 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 no. God wants us to actively be pursuing him because we need to be in that place where we're so close to the shepherd that we can hear what the shepherd is saying. He says, my sheep know my voice, and they listen. Are you listening to the voice of the shepherd? Are you taking a stand on the promises of God and his word? Do you have a relationship at that level? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Are you still walking around in pride? Saying, I'm not, I'm, I'm not so bad. I'm not as bad as the next guy. See, when I compare myself to the next guy, we, can say, we, we say we're not so bad. We are self-right. We are self-righteous. But that's not the standard that God uses. He says there's none righteous. No, not one. If you can establish a relationship with the Father and therefore uh, make it into heaven based on your righteousness, Jesus would not have had to die. You would be the exception. So when he asks, why shall I let you into my heaven? And, and your response is, well, I've given to the homeless. I've, 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 you know, raised my kids as best I can. I did this, I did that. But then he's going to turn around and say, have you always done the right thing? Who can say they've always done the right thing? Who can say they've always done the right thing? Even when I take the Ten Commandments, have I always honored my father and my mother? No. Have I always, you know, had pure thoughts about anything? No. And see, if we become honest with who we are, and just put them up against, have I always told the truth? Have you always told the truth? Have you always told the truth? No. What do you call people who don't tell the truth? Liars. 
have you always honored the Father in terms of your speech? Well, when you don't honor him, it's called blasphemy. You know, adultery. Jesus said it's 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 Jesus says to to look at someone with lust in your heart is to commit adultery in your heart. And then he says there's no thieves, no liars, no no adulterers. We're gonna make it into heaven. So we're all guilty, and what we all deserve is hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That when I humble myself, he doesn't give me what I deserve. He gives me what I need. Mercy. Amen. Don't go before God asking for justice. If you go before God asking for justice, you will get just what you deserve. I don't ask for justice. I ask for mercy. I ask for grace. And, and because God has given me his grace... Now I extend grace toward other people because I'm not perfect and neither are you. We all need a Savior. And so if you're here today, if you've not yet bowed your heart and humbled your heart to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you're playing the Monopoly game, I don't care if you're rich, poor, middle income, that is your waking every thought, your hustle, you got your hustle on. If you're here today and you know that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, it'd be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer of commitment to Him. Because today could be the first day of the best day of the rest of your life when you come into relationship. Jesus says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. I know exactly what you need. What I'm requiring of you is to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added. He knows you need food. He knows you need clothing. He knows you need peace. There's some of you don't have peace. You don't have peace. You don't have peace. Well, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And start pressing in and sowing into that, Lord, I want your peace in my life. And the closer you get to him, well, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Whatever is tormenting you cannot stay, will not stay, can. I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to try to get as close as I can to the Father. Because in that is my peace and in that is my victory. So if that's you today, if you're listening on the sound of my voice and you want to make that declaration of your heart to him, Again, it would be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer. Let's everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And say something like this. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. And I thank you for your amazing grace, your love that you poured out on me through your son, Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that maybe my, the priorities of my heart have not always been good. Say you're sorry. Say, I'm sorry, Lord. I humble myself before you, and I am sorry for taking the direction of my own, for doing my own thing, for getting caught up in the game. From this day forward, Lord, I seek to follow you. I surrender all to you. I want to be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Thank you for dying on the cross three days later, rising from the dead. And because you live, I will live as well. I place my faith and trust in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, with your power, and with your love. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it, let somebody know. If you're here in, in the sanctuary, we're going to go over how to fill out a paperwork, and, and that could be how you tell somebody. But if you're listening online, 
let someone know. Jesus said, if you confess me before the Father, I'll confess you before, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. So it's important for us not to be closet Christians. Let somebody know, I am a Christ follower. I am not ashamed of him. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed your time with us. If you did, please share today's message with a friend. It may be just what they need to hear. If you gave your life to Christ today, recommitted your life to Christ, or if you have a specific prayer need, please let us know by going to lwccftl.org prayer and filling out the form. If you have not yet worshipped today by way of giving, you can also do so via our website or by simply texting the amount you would like to give to 954-329-1199. We hope you have a great week and we're looking forward to the next time we meet. God bless and stay safe.